The first question, at what level should an impurity be included in the drug substance specification? Hi, um, this is a good question. Um, for drug substance within the scope of ICHQ3A, any impurity greater than the identification threshold should be included in the specification. If the impurity is unusually potent or toxic, the threshold to list the impurity in the specification is determined on case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, as for direct comparison to RLD in D2S01, slide number 11 of your presentation, does that mean direct comparison of generic drug substance versus innovative drug product, or should it be a generic drug product versus an innovative drug product? Um, yes, it is the comparison between drug substance and the innovative drug product. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Lai. If the USP monograph does not have a list of specified impurities, can we use other compendia such as EP for the purpose of impurity qualification? And this is a good question. Um, the answer is yes. There are cases that drug substance in the USP doesn't have a list of specified impurity or the impurity is not specified in the USP. If other companion monographs such as EP, DP, or even JP provide a list of specified impurities, the impurity limits may be acceptable as long as there is no apparent risk such as uh, structure alert for mutagenic impurity. We do have a map uh, for that. The title of map is uh, Acceptability of Standards from Alternative Companion. You might refer that for more details. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one last question for Dr. Lai. How can a DMF holder obtain the impurities data on the RLD. Is this information available to the public? No, uh, the information is not for public. It is a proprietary information. You need to analyze all the check product to get those uh, uh, specification. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next round of questions will be directed to Dr. Scott. And here's the question. Fermentation API are out of the scope for ICHM7. What about semi-synthetic APIs, which are originated from fermentation-based key, a key starting material? Please give us guidance. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I refer you to the ICH website to check out the draft Q&A document number 2.1. The Q&A reads, uh, question, are semi-synthetic drug substances and drug products included in the scope of ICH M7? And the answer is yes for certain cases. If a semi-synthetic drug substance is manufactured using steps that could introduce mutagenic impurities or degradants, for example, post-modification of a fermentation product or late stage introduction of a linker, a risk assessment is warranted. The following compounds used in the manufacturing process of semi-synthetic drug substances and drug products should be considered within the scope of the application of ICH M7. They are chemically synthesized intermediates and actual impurities therein or reagents. 
Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question. Is an AIMS test on its own enough for FDA to accept the non-mutagenic potential of an impurity? Thank you for that question. Another good one. Yes, uh, per ICHM 7, Section 6, an appropriately conducted AIMS assay with a negative experimental result would override any structure-based concerns from QSAR predictions. Our safety colleagues within the farm tox group would be consulted and they would determine that your AIMS assay test conditions were appropriate and fit for purpose. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, which class is applicable for unknown mutagenicity with known carcinogens? Thank you for that question as well. This is another question that's covered on the ICH website draft Q&A document. It's number 3.1. And the question reads, should non-mutagenic carcinogenic impurities be controlled according to ICHM7? And the answer is no. Carcinogens that are negative in the AIMS assay do not have a DNA reactive mechanism of carcinogenicity and therefore are not in scope of ICHM7 guidelines. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Got one last question for Dr. Scott in this round. Do we need to include QSAR study data for impurities in a DMF or would just a table be enough? Thanks for that. So in my presentation, I showed you the example hazard assessment table. And in that, there was a column for the hazard assessment that included um, any literature data, uh, and then the two QSAR models that are required to be used per ICHM7. So you can provide us just a summary of what the model outputs were um, in, in those instances. We would also like you to tell us the names and versions of the models and then if you're applying any expert knowledge, you should provide that in detail as well. Um, and I'll refer you back to Dr. Krulak's presentation with regard to uh, what we mean by expert knowledge. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. The next round of questions are directed to Dr. Krulak. And here's the first question. As CP, DB is now retired, which database does FDA recommend to mutagenic carcinogens acceptable intake limit? Thank you for that question. Uh, so although the National Library of Medicine is no longer maintaining the CPDB, which is the Carcinogenic Potency Database, the data are actually archived and available in a couple of other sources on the internet, and I know that these are widely used by industry representatives. The first is a website called ToxPlanet, that's all one word, T-O-X-P-L-A-N-E-T. Uh, and the other is LASA Limited's carcinogenicity database, where they have extracted the data from the CPDB and added a structurally searchable interface so that one can search for a particular chemical by structure rather than needing to know a CAS number or a name uh, and, and pull back the legacy records that were originally uh, created under the CPDB. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Krulak. Per your presentation, if the rest of the QSAR software mentioned in D2S03 slide number eight are used for assessment such as EPA, TST, forward slash tox tree, 
does the applicant need to submit supporting documentation to demonstrate the model is fit for purpose? So it is recommended that supporting documentation be provided for any of those tools listed on slide eight that are not routinely used at FDA CEDAR. And you may recall the ones in the red box at the top were the ones that we are very familiar with uh, and we would accept the predictions for. So when you go outside of that, yes, it's, it's highly recommended that additional uh, information be provided about those models to really demonstrate that they're appropriate for use. As I mentioned in my presentation, the common format for presenting that information is the QSAR model reporting format, which is a very in-depth, lengthy document that contains information about the validation statistics, the performance of the models, as well as details about the type of methodology that was used to uh, construct the, the model. I might caution uh, anyone that's using software from that list, and I'll say that that list was intended as a snapshot of some of the models that we've seen in regulatory submissions. I would caution you that some of the models were capped a very long time ago. So although they're, um, they're still available, the training sets were capped um, more than 10 years ago. And those types of older training sets do not represent the most current information that's available uh, on, from AIMS testing. And so they're probably not going to give you the most reliable uh, prediction compared to something that was updated recently and, and contains current knowledge of the endpoint. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Krulak. Is it necessary to predict the mutagenicity by both methods, in other words, expert rule-based and statistical rule-based? Can we only go by one method like the more reliable statistical rule-based? Under the ICHM 7 guideline, we require that both methodologies are used for a more comprehensive prediction of mutagenicity. The reason that that is, is because the expert rule-based system perceives structure and also is trained on different information than the statistical-based models are. And so by using a combination of the two, they really are complementing one another. And what we sometimes find is that one platform doesn't have enough information to actually identify an alert and will give a negative prediction, but the other platform will give a positive. So um, we're then creating greater sensitivity in our predictions to increase the chance that we will not miss any mutagens, because really that's our main concern is uh, exposing patients to mutagens uh, accidentally. I mean, we really want to avoid that. So using those two methodologies and saying, if either one is positive, we're going to treat this impurity as positive unless we have other evidence to dismiss it. That is going to be the best way to protect patient safety. Thank you for responding to that question. One last question for Dr. Krulak. What happens when out-of-domain results are observed for a particular impurity under different QSAR models? Is AIM study required to conclude that impurity is a potential genotoxic? And also, how do we classify this kind of molecule in accordance with Table 1 ICHM7. So in a case where you run multiple QSAR models and you're getting out of domain results consistently, QSAR is just not the right approach for a classification. So you need to have some other kind of follow-up measure. Uh, and the, the most common way of doing that is to do an AIMS test. And then ultimately, the outcome of that AIMS test will then support your classification uh, where the impurity is either going to be class 5 as non-mutagenic or class 2 as, as demonstrated to be mutagenic through the AIMS test. Um, so I think that's one common approach as a follow-up. Another approach that I've seen in the new drug space is actually to just treat that impurity as mutagenic and assign it to 
class three uh, and, and control it at, at, to TTC. So that's sort of an, an alternative. Um, but sometimes that's not a satisfying response because you don't definitively know what the mutagenic status is of that impurity. But it may be easier to do that rather than to have to synthesize test article and actually perform a names test. Thank you for responding to that question. The next group of questions will go to Dr. Lai. And here's the first question. Is it mandatory to use the same chromatographic system described in the USP monograph to analyze the impurity levels between my proposed generic and the RLD in case that the current USP monograph describes a TLC as an analytical method would it be acceptable to use an HPLC as an impurity method for my generic drug? And this is a good question. And um, if USP list a liquid method, um, you can choose USP method or in-house method. However, in-house method uh, has to be uh, analyzed for method equivalency. So to answer your question, it is not mandatory to use USP method for impurity analysis. Uh, for second part of the question is uh, TLC method. In case that USP list TLC method is acceptable, you use a uh, validated stability in-house HPLC method for impurity analysis. And however, we do request method equivalency between in-house HPLC method and the USP TLC method. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question. If acceptance criteria for unspecified impurities in USP monograph are higher than ICH Q3A, can we adopt the higher acceptance criteria per USP? This is a good question. Um, for check substance excluded by ICH Q3A, the limit for any unspecified impurity is determined on case-by-case -case basis. We will take into consideration of other accepted specific specification for the same drug substance. If drug substance is within the scope of ICHQ3A, acceptance criteria for any unspecified impurity should be set no more than the identification threshold of ICHQ3A. Even in some cases um, where higher acceptance criteria are listed in the USP. On the other side, if the acceptance criteria in USP are lower than the identification threshold of ICHQ3A, the acceptance criteria should be set to the USP level. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, can the proposed limit of a degradation byproduct in the drug substance be accepted under qualification threshold of ICHQ3B? This is a good question. The answer is no. ICHQ3B applies to drug product, while ICHQ3A applies to drug substance. The qualification threshold of Q3B is looser than that of Q3A. Because degradation impurity, impurities tends to increase in the manufacturing process and during storage, we request a tighter control at drug substance stage. Therefore, control of degradation impurities in drug substance with Q3B qualification might not be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. 
Got a couple more questions for Dr. Lai. Are the limits for residual solvents and elemental impurities expressed on the active base of the drug substance without considering the counter ion? Yeah, that's a good question. The answer is yes. And drug substance counter ion is excluded in the calculation for, uh, of the limit for residual solvents and elemental impurities. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next group of questions will be directed to Dr. Scott. In the case of APIs that are genotoxic at therapeutic concentrations, is QSAR evaluation required? Thanks for that question. Uh, the answer is no. In these cases, we wouldn't expect impurities um, to increase the cancer risk. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Scott. A DMF was submitted for a drug linker, which is a drug substance intermediate of an antibody drug conjugate drug product. Should the drug linker be assessed for mutagenic impurities per ICHM7 or is it out of the scope of ICHM7? Uh, that's a really good question and probably would be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. But in general, I think for this, the ICHM7 Q&A document would encourage you to provide your hazard assessment for the linker portion. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Scott, do analytical methods used for FATE and PURGE studies need to be validated? Thank you for that question. So full validation of release methods would be required if you chose an option one control strategy. In cases where other options are chosen or you use a spike purge study, um, due to the sensitivity requirements of those spike purge methods, it's recommended that the method description, system suitability, specificity, linearity and range, accuracy, precision, and LOD LOQ be provided for ease of our agency review, we want to make sure that those spike purge studies and the method that was used for them were fit for purpose, especially down to the lower levels that are required. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The last question for Dr. Spot, uh, Dr. Scott, in case of drugs intended to be used for cancer, the hazard assessment for the impurities derived from the reagent in other words, not related organic impurities of the drug substance, of drugs, is it also out of the scope? Thanks for that question. Uh, that's right. If the drug product is intended for advanced cancer, as defined by ICHS9, um, it's out of scope of ICHM7. Thank you for responding to that question. The next round of questions are for Dr. Krulak. And here's the first question. What is the agency's position for citing data from structurally similar compounds to justify classification? That's a good question. Uh, so to clarify, we can use data from structurally similar compounds to support a QSAR analysis that's already been conducted as part of its application of expert knowledge. But you can't use those structurally similar compounds to replace the use of QSAR. 
to then classify your impurity. So if it's being done in addition to your QSAR analysis to confirm that the prediction that's being obtained from the two complementary models is actually meaningful, it makes sense, it, it's based on good mechanistic insight, uh, then that's acceptable and actually encouraged because using that extra layer of analysis is going to result in a more robust prediction. But the, the structurally similar uh, analysis is not going to be able to be used as a standalone method for uh, assigning an impurity to a certain impurity class. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, how do we know that any QSAR tool is validated for a particular endpoint, for example, mutagenicity, sensitization, etc.? So as of right now, the only regulatory guidelines for pharmaceuticals that allow QSAR to be used as a replacement for empirical testing is ICHM7. Uh, so that's really the only case where you have a clear regulatory pathway for applying QSAR. But with respect to the validation, um, if what the question is asking about is how well the model performs in experimental testing, or rather in, in testing it against a new set of data, uh, that information should be contained within the QSAR model reporting format document. There will be a series of statistics that are reported from when the model was constructed uh, and tested using methods such as recall or cross-validation, but there should also be some statistics in there for external validation to show how that model performed when it was used to predict a, an external set of data that were never used to construct the model, to essentially challenge it to see how well it it performs. Uh, so if that's what the validation part of the question is referring to, that information can be found uh, in the QMRF. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question. If the data from QSAR ends as inconclusive, can we seek the conclusion from FDA to determine the impurity limitation via controlled correspondence. So if the end result of your QSAR analysis is inconclusive, or sometimes we refer to that as equivocal EQV, that was actually another question that came in, what does EQV mean on the slides that I presented? Um, we will treat that as potentially mutagenic. We're going to interpret that as containing a weak structural alert and the impurity will automatically be, be, be assigned to class 3 based on the QSAR analysis. But what I would say is that in cases where you have an equivocal prediction, that's really saying that there's some evidence to support that structural alert but some against. So that structural alert is derived from both negative and positive chemicals in equal balance. And so in many cases, in fact, in the majority of cases, if you apply expert knowledge to that prediction, you can often push that to a clear negative or a clear positive prediction and then have a much more confident classification for your impurity. And so our recommended approach would actually be to first apply expert knowledge and try and resolve that equivocal prediction. But if you don't want to apply expert knowledge, then it's going to be treated as class three. It's going to be treated as containing a structural alert and being potentially mutagenic. Thank you for responding to that question. We have two more questions for Dr. Krulak. Does the computer evaluate the structure only of the API in a drug product, or does it evaluate the chemical structures of the API and each inactive ingredient? So the QSAR model is going to interpret whatever structures you put in as input files. 
So when you run a QSAR analysis, it knows nothing about the, the composition of your drug product. It needs to have a chemical structure that's drawn into the window and imported into the, into the software. And then based on that chemical structure, it will make a prediction. So you can run whatever structures you wish through it. Uh, a typical approach though for impurity assessments is to run each of the impurities and then also run the API. Uh, that allows you to see if one of the alerts that's present in the impurity is actually also present in the API. And typically the APIs we're talking about here are, are empirically negative. So if we see that same alert in the same chemical environment in the API, uh, we can dismiss that because we know the API is already uh, is already negative. So we can then treat whatever impurity contains that same alert uh, as class five and overrule that structural alert. Thank you for responding to that question. And the last question for Dr. Krulak. A chemical substance is predicted negative by both Derek and Sarah. However, the overall summary is inconclusive. Can we make a prediction that this substance is a non-mutagenic? So some QSAR software provide a tool to consolidate the information that comes from the two individual models and give an overall conclusion. And that's intended to help in your expert review process. However, it's not recommended that that just be blindly accepted because that, that roll up, that, that consolidation of evidence is done algorithmically. It's not done by a human. Uh, so what we would recommend is that the individual predictions from the software um, be presented in, in the table of results that's in the submission. Um, and then expert knowledge be applied just to confirm that those predictions are actually valid. Now, in the case of where the roll-up, the automatic roll-up is giving you an inconclusive result, that's an indicator that maybe there's low confidence associated with one or perhaps both of those negative predictions that you're getting from the, the individual models. So that is an indicator that you probably want to look at that a little more closely and just see what it is that the software has a problem with uh, that's leading to this inconclusive um, conclusion. So that would be part of your expert knowledge that you're applying to the set of predictions. And as Barbara mentioned, you know, document what you've done, what you've looked at to then justify to us that yes, indeed, we can dismiss that inconclusive concern that the software has uh, and assign that impurity reliably to class five. Thank you for responding to that question. It looks like we have time for just one more question, and this last question will go to Dr. Lai. In the case of the isopropyl ether, if its level can only be controlled to, for example, about 200 parts per million during production, would a higher proposed limit be accepted? And um, this is a good question, and it depends. If MDD, and uh, in my but it depends. In my case, the MDD is uh, four gram. Therefore, the PD per million daily exposure is, is is quite high. If MDD of your drug substance is much low in the, much low than four gram, the the limit in your product could be higher than two hundred ppm. So. My answer is it's case by case. Thank you. Thank you so much for our panelists for answering all the questions that came in and for the great presentations.